Well, good morning, everybody. Hey, it's good to see you this morning. I uh, know that we got a lot out. It's uh, June. It is summertime, and it looks like we're all taking advantage of it. And that's a good thing. That's a good thing. But we're taking advantage of Sunday, right? We're here and uh, happy to be here and happy that for those of you that are joining us online, we're glad that you're here as well. Um, Today, we have a great service planned for you. Uh, As always, we're going to sing a few songs together. We're going to continue in a message series, and then we're going to take communion together uh, after everything is, uh, is concluded with the series today. And in fact, that series we're continuing is called, Who Do You Think You Are? And we are addressing the question of, who are you? What is your identity? And no matter what you think about you, no matter what maybe other people think about you or have said about you, what God says about you and thinks of you is what is absolutely most important. And today, our focus um, on this other aspect of identity is we're looking at what Jesus actually specifically says about us. And just to give, um, let the cat out of the bag, I guess, to give you a hint, he says that you are salt and you are light. You are salt and light. And so I look forward to jumping into that and and talking about that more with you this morning. Um, Just as a reminder, as we have been uh, reminding you each and every week, um, we invite you to partner with us here at DCC in many ways. And uh, a few of those ways is to connect with us on Sunday mornings and and in Bible studies and groups, um, to also serve in ministry areas. And then also giving is a way that we partner together and we try to make giving easy for you. Um, there's certain, many ways there that you can see on the screen behind me that you can automate giving or you can give right here in person and we have boxes in the back or on your way out throughout the building. And uh, I just want to say thank you because your generosity helps to uh, move things along with ministry here at DCC and, and there is a lot going on. And so over the next actually few weeks, we're going to put some things on display for you to see. We're going to talk about some of those ministries, the missions, things that are happening because we want you to know um, where your generosity goes and how you are making great things happen in the community. And then also, as we say each week, no matter if you've been here for three weeks or maybe if you've been here for 30 years, we want you to take your next step. And your next step may be today, uh, if you're watching online, maybe uh, might be that you hear something in the Word or through a song that God speaks to you and He invites you each and every day, each and every moment to come back to Him as we talked about last week in this series. And so we want to give you that invitation that if you've never placed your faith and trust in Jesus, we would love to talk with you about that, pray with you about that. Or maybe your next step is baptism or jumping into a group or maybe just attending here on Sunday morning, figuring that out. We would love to speak with you about that as well. Um, But for some of you, your next step is going to be more than that. You're going to dig deeper. And maybe it's jumping in on a ministry team here at the church and helping out. Maybe it's with a bottle land or upstreet, which is going on right now, or even inside out with our junior and senior high students on Wednesday nights. In fact, talking about them, uh, the junior high middle school students just got back from camp uh, this past Thursday night, about 12:30 a.m. <laughs> and so, uh, but it was wonderful to have them back, and they had such a good time. My own son went, and, and Matt's son, and, and others uh, had a blast learning more about God being their good shepherd, Jesus being their good shepherd, and and ultimately Psalm 23, I think, was the theme for the whole week. And so, it's been incredible hearing the conversation from these boys about what they learned and what they saw in their peers. And I asked Colin, I said, "What's your favorite part about this last week?" And he said, "Dad, that." how one week in somebody's life can change everything. I was like, that's cool. That's a great takeaway from that week at camp. And and so then this coming week, actually, our senior high students, uh, high schoolers, are going to camp as well. And so I want to invite you to pray with us while they are away, right? Because there's a lot of amazing things that happen at camp, and we know that's a, a pivotal circumstance and a turning point for many of them in their lives. And God can do amazing things just in a week's time, even in a day's time, to change someone's life forever. So we want to pray that God moves in their life and reveals himself to them. And then lastly, I want to say this. Uh, After service each and every week, uh, there's a group that gathers in the sanctuary here for prayer. And uh, I invite you to stick around after service. It just takes a few minutes and to share that if you have something in your life that you would like for us to pray with or about uh, for you or your family, then we would love the opportunity to do that. So stick around for a few minutes after service and uh, pray with us. Amen? All right. Well, let's, let's uh, pray at this time, open up service, and then uh, we'll begin. Father, we love you and we thank you for this morning. We thank you for your goodness and for your mercy. We thank you for the opportunity to be here, to be present, to have the opportunity to worship you. And God, I just pray this morning that uh, in all that we say and all that we do, 
in all of our moments this morning as we gather together that you unite us through your spirit and through the truth of your word and that you change us because that's what your word does. It, it makes us new. And so I pray that through your wisdom of your word that we gain wisdom and understanding to know the good things that we ought to do in this life. And Father, that you give us the strength to do it. Give us the eyes to see and the ears to hear. And Father, right now, give us the hearts to open up to you, to give you thanks, to give you glory. And we ask this in the matchless name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Stand up, gather around, and greet somebody this morning as we begin.
forsaken we're a child of God and you know we've been singing this song every week too you say and you know it's been everybody knows this song everybody knows this song but I think it's one thing to sing it but it's one thing to get it on the inside of you and listen to these words you say I am loved you say I am strong so just get these words inside of you this morning as we sing this for you you say
that this is a privilege here in this country, and we're so grateful for that, God. I just pray that the message today would bless our hearts and that we would just go home forever changed. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Once again, good morning and uh, welcome to everybody in the room and those of you that are joining us online, we want to say welcome to you as well as we continue this series today, Who Do You Think You Are? And I want to begin it by asking a question. Maybe it's a question that you're familiar with. I think it's a question that's asked of every single person on this planet at, in every generation at all times and it's simply this, what do you want to be when you grow up? What do you want to be when you grow up? You probably remember being asked this question even as a child and somebody took an interest and said, hey, tell me, what are your hopes and dreams? Like, what do you want to be when you grow up? But now to make it apply to most of us in the room, we need to ask it a different way. We'll ask it this way. What did you want to be before you grew up? right? Because many of you right now, you, you're there at that stage. It's kind of past the, what do I want to be when I grow up? You've grown up. And now you, you kind of look back maybe and reflect on what was it that I wanted to be before I grew up? But really, this question even isn't the true question because at the end of the day, the focus really isn't on what you want to be or who you're going to be, but more on a focus on what you want to do. So we'll ask it this way. What did you want to do before you grew up? Because that's really what we're asking. We're asking this because we live in a world that is obsessed with what we do, the focus on our activity and, and what we do, not on necessarily who we are or who we want to be, but on what we do. In fact, you can go to work tomorrow and somebody, more than likely, you could be sitting around the water cooler or in the break room or wherever, and you're going to hear somebody ask a question about something you've done over this past weekend or even for the summertime. Maybe these are a few ideas of this that you might encounter sometime this next week. Like, what do you do for a living, right? When you first meet somebody, you can throw those up there. What do you do for a living? When you meet somebody for the first time, that's one of the first questions we ask, or it's one of the surface level questions because we feel like, you know, that's a way to get the conversation started. Or what do your kids do, You're right? They may play sports or maybe they're in college and you can begin to frame a conversation around that. What do you do for fun? That's another great question. Or what did you do this weekend? What did you do? What was your activity? What is going on in your life? And the reason we ask these questions is because, again, of an underlying, I will say, obsession, so to speak, or turn towards what we do and towards our activity. The world has this way of looking at activity in our life as being a determining factor in who we are. Or to say it this way, your activity determines your identity. Let's, your activity determines your identity. What you do determines who you are. That's the way that the world views things a lot of times. That's why we approach people and we ask that question up front. What do you do? And this what you do, your answer determines for a lot of people who you are. It impacts their view of you and your identity to them. To say it all in kind of a complete sentence, we'll say this. Our world is obsessed with our activity and what you do, but God is, he cares about your identity and who you are. God cares more about who you are because in the ways of the Lord that is opposite to the ways of the world and the ways of the kingdom of God, which is opposite to the kingdom of the world, God doesn't put activity first as the determining factor, but he puts your identity first. And he says, we, we've got this wrong. It's our identity that should determine our activity. It's who you are that should determine then what you do. And we understand this. We understand this. We get this. At the end of the day, when we look at the question of what did you want to do or what do you want to be when you grow up, we know that the focus on what we do is not the right focus. We get that. 
But the problem is that's what we live. Again, to say it this way, as we said through this whole series, when you know who you are, then you'll know what to do. We understand that to be even more true. When I know who I am, then I know the things that I can do, but the things that get in the way are the problem. Or to use these two words, these are the obstacles, if you will, that seem to get in the way of most believers. First, distraction, because many things in life begin to distract us. And if we're focused on activity, then there are many activities that can get in the way of the primary activity that you and I as Christians, as followers of Jesus, are supposed to be living out. And that activity and distraction then can create conformity in the world. I mean, you get this, you understand this, you've seen this, right? How many times as a Christian have you found yourself caught up in things of the world instead of things of the kingdom? Do you think there's a reason why the Apostle Paul writes and that Jesus talked about that we should fix our eyes on the things of heaven and not on things of this earth? Of course there is, because he knew our tendency to get distracted by the things in front of us. He knew our tendency to get this flip-flopped, and not that our identity determines our activity, but that we would begin to believe that our activity determines our identity. Now, another way that I know this is true is through this responsibility of pastoring at DCC, I've seen many men transition, and women, transition from, from working their entire life and then entering into retirement. And something happens to these men and women when their activity has determined their identity for so long, when they were distracted and they began to conform their identity to the ways of the world and what they did. And these men and women both lose a sense of themselves in this transition of retirement. It's like all my activity has ceased, it stopped, and so now I hear them say, I don't even know who I am anymore. It's like, oh, well, you know, this makes sense because all of us do this from time to time. All of us feel this from time to time. And that's why this happens in, in other areas too. When there's a loss in the family or a loved one, because we find identity in relationships as well. When there's a career that is lost, when there's a transition in life, even with our children maybe moving on and we become empty nesters, that's also uh, an identity crisis for many men and women. That's why marriages are rocked when people become empty nesters a lot of times because now they have to rewire, they have to rethink. Their, their activity is not in an identity that I'm a parent in the activity of the children, but now it's wrapped up in, whoa, I gotta remember I'm a spouse here first. And so we see this in many areas of life and even scripture speaks into this. The apostle Paul writes in Romans 12, you're familiar with this verse, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world don't conform to the patterns of this world. But what does he say? Let God transform you into a new person. And in the past two weeks of this series, we've been talking about being a new creation, that God created us anew in Christ, and now we are his masterpiece, and he has prepared good deeds for us to do long before we ever got on this planet. Long before we were born, God ordained these things and put them into motion. David even talks about it in his Psalms, as we saw. You're a new person. Let God make you this new person by changing the way you think. Not becoming distracted by the activities of the world to determine our identity, but instead, no, to look at our identity in Christ, this new person that we are, and then you will learn to know God's will. And God's will ultimately are the things that we are to be doing, right? Last week we looked at this, that we are ambassadors of Christ, that we are to be living our lives in such a way that God is making his appeal through us and we are pleading with the world, come back to God. An identity that Jesus gave, we are ambassadors doing God's will, which is good and pleasing and perfect. So you see, God says, I wanna make you new. I wanna transform you. I wanna change you. And then through this changed identity, I'm going to impact now what you do. Not your will be done, but his will be done. Now today as we talk about this, we're gonna look at the next identity as I've already told you that Jesus gave us and in his teachings, 
Uh, we're going to look at Matthew chapter 5, and this comes straight from the Sermon on the Mount. So, you know, an amazing teaching of Jesus, and he's going to tell us that we are both salt and light. He's going to give you an identity, and this is an odd identity when you think about it. You are salt and light. This isn't like saying you're a masterpiece, right, and, and you're an ambassador, but now he's comparing you to two elements in the world, a mineral and then, of course, light. And so... <clears throat> It's fun to dive into this because where it's found is in the first part of the Sermon on the Mount. And the Sermon on the Mount, to give you some context, was one of Jesus' most famous messages. And I think it wasn't just preached once, but I think these teachings from this particular sermon that Jesus taught were taught multiple times. It seems to be things that he came back to because he wanted to make sure that people had a solid foundation in these teachings. And he begins the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, with the Beatitudes. And everybody's familiar with that, right? Blessed are the, and they fill in the blank, for they will, and they'll fill in another blank. And so he's kind of giving these virtues and saying, this is how you're supposed to be. You know, blessed are the peacemakers, blessed are the poor in spirit. And then he, he moves right out of that into this teaching that you are salt and you are light. Or this is the way Jesus begins it, Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. He says, you are the salt of the earth. So he's teaching a crowd of people, his disciples, a crowd of people who are questioning, you know, who is this Jesus? They're trying to figure out who he is. You've also got religious leaders on the outskirts. I mean, this is a mixed group of people, but he's focusing on his disciples and the people who are there to receive the word of God. And he says, you are the salt of the earth. Not you're the salt of your family, you're the salt of your household. You're the salt of your local synagogue or your local church. You're the salt of your community. No, he says, you are the salt of the earth. It's like, well, wait a minute. You know, I got to process that, right? Jesus, um, you were talking about being like, you know, peacemakers and children of God and all these wonderful things. And then just this hard transition into you're the salt of the earth. And I started to think about salt. And I know that the audience there would have too. What does that mean, salt? If you're comparing me to salt, what does salt do? And I found a few things, but this isn't an exhaustive list, but these three things are what came up uh, as I began to, to study this out. And the first one is precious. The one thing I learned about salt, interesting through a historical perspective, is that Roman soldiers, did you know, were often paid in salt, not necessarily in money, because salt was so valuable. It was such an expensive commodity. A lot of times they were paid for their service in salt which is where you also maybe get the saying, they're not worth their salt. You ever heard that before? It's an old saying, but stands. Uh, and so they're not worth their salt. They were paid in salt, so it's a precious, precious commodity. It was worth a lot of money, okay? And, and that's one of the big things about salt, that it was worth something. And so Jesus is telling the audience, you are like salt. You're worth something. And then I found that one of the functions of salt is to preserve that they put it on meats because there was no refrigeration at the time or a limited amount of type of refrigeration at the time. And so they would put this on things to preserve those things. It would stop the process of decay. It would kind of put decay and corruption at, at a halt, right? Just slow it down. It's not that it wouldn't happen over time, but that it would slow it way, way, way down. And so he's telling this group of people, you're salt, you are a preserving agent in the world. In, in my kingdom, this is what I expect of you. To preserve goodness and righteousness and the things of God, but also to slow down and stop the decay and the corruption. You should be an agent in the world that is helping people to stay strong, to stay in their faith. And then lastly, it's palatable, it has flavor, it has taste. It's, it's to, to brighten the flavors and taste of foods, right? And so people put this on their foods. Maybe you like salt, you might like salt a little too much, I don't know, but I, I watch some people, some people just sprinkle, right? Some people dash or whatever. And then other people want to empty the whole shaker on their food. Is anybody like that in here? I don't know how you even taste your food, it's just salt. But you like it, it's palatable, it's flavorful for you. And so if Jesus says that we are salt of the earth, then I think we ought to take him at his word. And maybe that's what we practice today. We just begin by saying it together. So we're going to put this up here, and we're going to say this statement together like we have every single week. So join with me. Let's say it. I am the salt of the earth. I am the salt of the earth. It's not Derek telling you that. 
It's not just because it's on a screen here that you see it, but, but Jesus said of you that if you're in Christ, in him, then you are the salt of the earth. That's incredible. But then he continues, and the reason he continues is because for a lot of people, he's showing why he has to say it. Why do I need to remind my people that they are salt? And here's, here's what he says in the next part of the verse. But what good is salt if it has lost its flavor? What good is salt if it's losing its saltiness or if it's lost its saltiness? It loses its flavor. And I had to look at that too. I was like, oh, wait a minute. I mean, salt is salt. How can salt lose its flavor? And did you know that if there is no outside force against it, salt doesn't lose its flavor? Did you know that? Unless it's acted upon by an outside force or something has a, a, a turn or change, a chemical imbalance, a chemical change with the salt, it will always keep its saltiness. It will always keep its flavor. I didn't know that. I thought maybe over time that it, it would break down, but it can't because it's a chemical compound and it is what makes it salt. I thought that was cool. And so I began to think, well, what is it then? How does salt lose its flavor? And I found two things. The first one is contamination. Some type of foreign agent is added to the salt, and the salt can begin to lose its flavor. Isn't that interesting? An outside force or an outside contaminant gets into the salt, mixes with the salt, and then the salt begins to lose its flavor and can begin to break down because of the exchange of ions. And I know it's too deep, right? We don't even want to talk about that. But that causes it to lose its flavor. Did you know you could electrify it, and that exchanges ions, and it loses its flavor, and you can even burn it, and then it's really good for nothing, right? Like most things, that's a chemical change in science class. You weren't expecting that today, were you? Welcome to DCC. History and science. But the other part of this, it, the other way that it can lose its flavor is through dilution or to be diluted in water. And you've experienced this, right? You, you know that you can create salt water, right? And if you put it in water long enough and let it stay, it'll begin to mess with the, the compound itself and it will lose its flavor and its palatable uh, you know, elements to it. And again, so I started thinking about that. And I was like, okay, wait a minute. You know, Jesus is comparing us to salt. So he's like, look, if you're mine, then, then you're supposed to be salty. Now, in our world today, that's not a good thing, right? You don't want to be salty, evidently. Millennial talk, Gen Z, whatever. Being salty is not a good thing. Jesus says it's good. So world, Jesus, I'm going to go with Jesus. So <clears throat> I, I want to be salty, right? Like that's the whole point. You just, yeah, how's the salt content for you? But the problem here is, am I allowing contaminants into my life? Are you allowing contaminants into your life that are causing you to lose your flavor, to lose your saltiness? Or maybe it's not the contaminants, but it's just you're overloading your life so much that it's diluting it down, that, that it's not as, as precise as it used to be, right? It's just kind of dulling the flavor. But the reason Jesus has to talk about this is because it's an unfortunate truth that, yeah, we are. Yes, we do. His first century audience did, and so do we. And so he knew it was important to talk to his people, to, say, to remind them, what good is salt if it loses its flavor? And all of the audience would say, it's not, right? Like, Salt that doesn't have flavor is pointless. It doesn't even exist, really, because it's no longer salt. And Jesus is like, yeah, exactly. In fact, he asks another question of this. He says, can you make it salty again? Verse 13, can you make it salty again? What can you do to bring back the saltiness? And guess what the answer is? Nothing. You can't do anything to it. If you dilute it, you contaminate it, you've created a chemical change in it, it can never come back to be salt again. You can add more salt, that's different. But there's nothing you can do to make it salty again. And so he answers it. He says, of course not. It'll be thrown out, he says to them, and trampled underfoot. You know what they did with, with salt that had been diluted, that was worthless? 
They took it out in the roads and they just spread it on the ground and, and that's what helped to prepare roads, keep down weeds, etc. just because of that chemical compound with the sodium. Sodium chloride, more science. So Jesus answers the question and everybody in the audience was like, yeah, that makes sense. We've seen that happen, right? We, we know this to be true. And then he takes another left again and he's like, okay, so salt of the earth, but guess what else? He continues in verse 14, he says, and... You are the light of the world, to which I'm sure the audience, like us, if we really pause and read this, we would go, well, wait a minute. We're salt of the earth, and now you're saying we're the light of the world, not the light of our life or the light of my wife's life, you know, or the light of my children or my house or my community, my church. No, we're the light of the world. Think about that. On display for the whole world to see. And he says, yes, that's right. In fact, it's a lot like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. You're like this light that's a city on a hilltop and it cannot be hidden. And, and for us, we maybe don't give this enough thought because we don't deal with this a lot. We have street lamps, street lights, you know, things to illuminate, house lights, etc. Uh, and so a lot of our life is lit up, right? And you've heard of light pollution, you go into a city, there's so many lights, you know, you don't, you don't really see a light as a beacon anymore unless maybe you're on the seas, unless maybe you're looking for a lighthouse, right? Or maybe you're traveling in the dark and, and on the countryside and, and you're looking for a light because, you know, there, there's just darkness in the moon. But very seldom do we really give this much thought. But in ancient times, as people were traveling on dangerous roads where bandits and thieves existed, when you would see a city in the distance, you had confirmation that you were headed in the right direction. You had confirmation that, hey, there's hope on that hillside. That's a beacon of hope. And if I can just get there, that's a place of refuge for my life. So again, you know, the audience would have seen this quite differently than we do, but still there are some common characteristics of light. So I began to look at that. What are a few of the takeaways or characteristics of light? Here are just a few. One, light is used to illuminate. We know that. When there's a dark space, we turn on a light so that we can see, right? We can make things visible. That's exposure, if you will. If you were a child, maybe you wanted your nightlight on or a light in the closet on because you believe that in the darkness lurked things that you didn't want to have anything to do with, right? And as long as the light was on, everything felt safe. You could see what was there and, and what wasn't. But another aspect of light when it's talked about in Scripture is that light informs. Not only does it illuminate so you can see, but now you can know what is there and what is not there. It gives you information. In fact, we can even use light in today's world, more science, didn't know we were going there today. We can use light to transfer information, right? Everybody wants the high-speed internet, High-speed internet is now sent with light, fiber optic cable. So light can help to inform in many ways. And in our modern world, this makes a lot of sense to us. It makes sense to just in our physical world for all of us that it helps us to see and to know what is present. Scripture says in the New Testament also that light reveals to us truth is also called light or re referenced as light in the New Testament and teachings to us. And we get that. It's like I didn't know something and now I know something. What is the little thing, you know, in a cartoon? What happens over someone's head when they, when they come to know something? The light bulb comes on, Right? Because we know this is what light is like. It informs us. And then lastly, light, as I said, with the, the cities on a hill and what Jesus is talking about, it's an invitation. <clears throat> Name the company. I bet you can. Their slogan is, we'll leave the light on for you. Motel 6, we'll leave the light on for you. Why would they say that? Because you know that it's like, oh, that, that means I'm welcome. That's inviting to me, right? Have you ever had to go to somebody's house at night and when you show up and, and, and all the lights are off outside, you don't know where to go, you don't know what to do, the porch lights are off? It's not very welcoming, is it? If you're familiar with it, that's one thing. But if you're not and you're a guest, it seems very off-putting. 
I know that when I hear, you know, somebody's coming over, I immediately go to the foyer and I turn on the, the, the lights out on the front porch because I want them to know we're here, you're invited, this is where you need to come to, right? This is the place to, to enter. I want to make them feel comfortable. A light can be inviting to people. Come and be present. So I think that's so interesting, and I think about our lives then. So we're to illuminate. We're to bring the lights, turn the lights on for people, expose the darkness, to, to live a life in such a way that the light that we shine shows that some things we shouldn't do, and there are some things that we should do, right? Scripture teaches us, uh, Paul writes, that we should live as people of the light. Jesus talked about this. John writes about this. We should live as people who are in the light, not in the darkness. We should speak of things that are done in the daylight and not of things done in darkness. I, I think that's amazing at night. And so if Jesus says this, right, we're supposed to inform, we're supposed to invite, be welcoming, then I think we ought to take him at his word. So let's say this little statement together. We're going to add to it. The first part, we said, I am the salt of the earth. Let's say it together. I am the salt of the earth. The second part, and the light of the world. Let's say it again. I am the salt of the earth and the light of the world. And again, this isn't me telling you that. It's Jesus you want to be part of my family. You claim to be in me. Guess what? In case you didn't know, you're salt and you're light to the whole world. Now, again, just like with the salt, he didn't stop there because he knows we have a tendency not to live this out. He knows that we have a tendency to be the opposite, and so he has to reveal the obvious thing to the people that are there with him in the audience and to us as well. So he says this, no one, verse 15, he says, no one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket. What an odd comment, right? You're the light of the world, and then all of a sudden, hey, nobody turns on a light and then covers it up. That's just ridiculous. And when you think about it, it is ridiculous. Why would you even turn on a light at all if you're going to cover the light up? Like, what's the point of that? And then it hit me. Just like with the salt, the contaminants and the dilution, which is what makes it lose its flavor, the reasons that, I you know, just have a couple, that we would turn on a light and then hide the light, uh, they're pretty selfish, they're not good reasons. The only two things I could come up with, and they're kind of the same thing, but they are a little bit different. Just the nuances are different. But any time that I've turned on a light and I've tried to keep the light hidden is because I wanted to conceal what I was doing. Let me say that again because some of you, you, you need to hear that. The reason that in my life that I've turned on a light and then kept the light hidden is because I wanted to conceal what I was doing from somebody. I wanted to hide from somebody. I didn't want them to see my activity. And then I started thinking, man, this is, this is all of us, right, at times. I think it's interesting, we're talking about pop culture and language. They also use a term where you throw shade on people. Why do you think you would throw shade on someone or what that would even mean? Shade, right, is what we put over lights, to, to dim lights, whether it's a shade of the outside or, or it's a lamp or a covering. Maybe it's a basket or a bowl. We're trying to dim that light. We don't want that light exposed. We don't want someone to see. And as I studied that, I have to admit, that was pretty convicting and it made me feel pretty guilty about that. It made me start wondering, God, what is there in me that you need to reveal? I reminded of David, search me, O God, right? Examine my heart. What's in me, Father, that, that needs to be exposed and seen? What needs to be revealed? Is there a lie that needs to be revealed? Is, is there a secret that needs to be put on display because I know that eventually, you know, we think we get away with secrets and hidden things, but Scripture teaches us that God is going to reveal all things, that all things at some point will be exposed before God. How 
How dangerous. So he says, <clears throat> nobody lights a lamp and puts it under a bowl, right? That's, that's silly. Nobody does this. He says, instead, the whole purpose of turning on the light at all or going to the, the, the effort of, of igniting a flame at all <coughs> is so that it gives light to everyone in the house. We don't hide it under a bowl. We put it on a stand so that that light can be bright. We put it up high so that it can shine that light down on everyone in the house. Everyone gets to enjoy it. Everyone gets to see. Makes sense, right? It's like, oh, yeah, that's the whole purpose of a light, to expose and to shine, to illuminate, to inform and to invite. And then one of the most profound verses that teaches us about our identity and about our activity, Matthew 5, 16, Jesus says, in the same way, just like that light is put on a stand for everybody in the house to see, let your good deeds shine out. That's your activity from your identity of being a light. Let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone, say everyone, everyone will praise your Father in heaven. Your salt and your light, and there's a purpose it's given to you in that identity that you can't separate from the identity. In fact, let's throw our comment up there now, our statement today. We're going to repeat the whole thing together. So let's just start at the top. Say it with me. I am the salt of the earth and a light in the darkness that brings glory to God. Those two things. Our saltiness should bring God glory in the world. The flavor, the preservation, the, those elements of salt should bring glory to God and his kingdom. And the light that we shine, our good deeds, our life, ought to shine so bright to people, it ought to be a welcoming invitation, a beacon of hope to people that exposes the darkness and brings things to light, brings the truth to light, and leads people in a new path. So I was like, okay, Jesus, why did you say this to this crowd of people? Why did they need to know this? And of course, the reason is because he wants us to apply it. He wants us to understand it and begin to live it in our own lives. And so here's a little self-evaluation, right? A little self-evaluation from this. First thing, the question that we need to be asking ourselves is, am I keeping my flavor Am I doing what it takes on a daily basis to keep my flavor, to remain salty, as Jesus would put it? Not in the millennial way, but in the kingdom of God way. Am I retaining my saltiness by not allowing contaminants in my life to change who I am or allowing things in my life to dilute who I am? Am I being diligent in this? Am I studying the word to learn of the promises of God and the principles of God to apply them in my life and to apply them in the lives of others? Am I learning to, to be changed in the spirit and for the fruit of the spirit to grow in my life because I ultimately know that it's all about relationships, right? Everything is relational. Love God and love people. Am I doing what I need to do to grow so that when I encounter other people, I'm different than the world that they're experiencing? I'm not part of the contaminants and part of the dilution that takes place, but instead I'm re retaining my saltiness. Or when you think about these three words, let's, let's use these to evaluate precious and pre uh, preserves and, and palatable. I, am I adding value to life and to the lives of other people? Am I preserving truth and goodness? And am I putting you know, a, a hold on decay and corruption? Am I slowing down the process? Is my presence in the lives of my friends or family helping to slow down the progression to the point that people can finally get a handle on truth and righteousness in a right way and escape the bondage of sin? Am I a palatable person? Do I add flavor to, to life? Do I make things better or do I make things worse? Do I lead people further in the path of sin and disobedience or do I lead them in a different direction? What a great evaluation tool, right? Or am I allowing contaminations and dilution to get the best of me? 
And that's only a question that, that you really can answer. Or maybe if you're bold, <laughs> ask your spouse. Ask your best friend. Say, look, you, you've got free reign to be honest with me. I just, it's going to be a little weird, but I know that I'm supposed to be like salt. And, you know, there's, there's some things about salt that, that I know. And, and I just want to see where I stand. The next part of the evaluation is, of course, with light. Am I shining my light? Are you shining your light? Or again, let's use the three words that we've already looked at in order to evaluate our lives. Is your life illuminating the good things of God in life, or are we remaining in darkness? Let's throw those words up there. Are we illuminating things in life, or are we remaining in darkness? Are we informing people about the good news of Jesus and the life that Jesus has for us? Or are we allowing the information of the world to dilute us, if you want to go back to the salt for a minute, and be the thing that we spread? Oh, no, we don't need to worry about thinking on heavenly things. Let's think about earthly things. Let's not think about what's righteous and noble and true and pure. Let's think about the things of the world. And it's all the opposite of those things. It's what's wicked and filthy and corrupted. Am I bringing the information, the gospel message of Jesus, the goodness of God into people's lives? And lastly, am, am, I, am I a walking invitation of Christ? When people see me, am I inviting to them? Do I draw them in? Am I willing to stop my busy life, right, that's being contaminated oftentimes, to pause and listen to the person beside me, to just figure out, hey, what is going on in your world? And what can I do to help? Are we being a beacon of hope like a city on a hill that cannot be hidden? Or do we allow our light to be hidden or concealed? Do we put our light under a basket? You can put that up there, Marcus. Do we want to hide away the light that we've been given? Do we want to conceal the fact that, well, you know, I'm a Jesus follower, but again, you know, I don't want to be one of those bold Jesus followers that goes out every day knowing my mission is to bring people to God. No, no, no. I just want to be a normal Christian, you know. I don't want to, you know, upset God. I want to please him, but, but it's, it's kind of limited, right, because I got other things going on. I'm going to conceal it, you know, just to this, to this place. You know, we're going to have a conversation, but let's just stick to sports and the weather, okay? Or, or let's stick to, well, what do you do for a living, right? What do you do for fun? What did you do last weekend? We just keep it there. I can hide all this, conceal this. I mean, they might think poorly of me if they find out who I am or what I believe. Jesus said it's a problem. And we lack the confidence. And as I said in part one of this, the biggest problem is at times we just don't believe it. Do you really believe that you're salt? And do you believe that you're light? We want to believe that we're saved, right? Because that's all it's all about. I am forgiven and saved. Thank you, God. It's all about me. I'm so glad that you died for me. But when Jesus says you're salt and you're light, I don't know about that. That makes it more difficult. That means there's an expectation. That means there's some accountability. But here's the thing, again. It's not your activity that brings about and determines the identity. It's the identity that determines the activity. And here's the thing that you and I have to wrap our heads around. God says, you are. That if you want to be in Christ, if you've placed your faith and trust in Jesus and you're claiming that God is your father, then God says, Jesus says, you are salt. You don't get to choose whether you are or not. That's what comes with the relationship. And you are light. We don't get to make that distinction ourselves. Or as we showed you earlier, it's your identity, we'll see here, that determines your activity, it's who you are that determines what you should be doing. Now, three real quick things and the reason why. The reason why this is so important, the reason why this is what we have to do is because there is so much at stake. There are literally lives at stake. 
there are young hearts and old hearts alike, young souls and old souls alike that are at stake. From you and I deciding to allow our identity in Christ and what God says about us is true, that we are salt and light to be the determining factor on what we do in our lives. Everything we say, everything we do. And so it reduces down to three words. The first one is relational. <coughs> Excuse me, it's relational. All of this has to do with your relationship with God, other people, and yourself. It's all relational. And in fact, in another gospel account in, in the book of Mark or the, the letter of Mark, gospel account of Mark, chapter 9, Jesus said this about salt. He said the same thing, another teaching, Mark captures it, and he's like, you know, salt, if it loses its saltiness, can't be made salty anymore. And he says, you must have, talking to his disciples, you must have the qualities of salt among yourselves and live in peace with each other. You must have. That's Jesus talking. You are salt, and if salt loses its saltiness, it has no value. So you must have these qualities of salt among yourselves relationally and live in peace with each other. So now he's connecting all those beatitudes he talked about. Blessed are the peacemakers with the aspect of what it means to be salt of the earth. Other places in Scripture, it talks about seasoning our conversation with salt. We know this and we get this. We have to be careful in our conduct. The second part of this, and the reason we have to be careful and intentional is the next word, because relationally speaking, we can't be flippant. We can't just, you know, lackadaisically go throughout our life and, and not put into practice what God says is true about us. Instead, we have to be intentional about this. It takes effort, because if we don't, then we're the reason why Jesus has to talk about these things at all, because we've forgotten We've become deluded. We've allowed the contaminants in. We, we're hiding or concealing our light because we don't want anybody to know or we would hate to offend someone. I mean, that's another reason I make sure that lights are turned off because sometimes I get up earlier than my family and I don't want to flip on the light because I don't want to bother my wife. I think there's a scripture about that. You know, don't bother your wife or your life will be short-lived or something like that. Maybe, I don't know, something like that. But I want to honor her in that. But I don't want to bother her. And, that, and that's the point. It's like sometimes we hide our light because we don't want to bother anybody, right? But do I allow that to determine who I am? I have to be intentional about being salt and light. You have to be intentional. I, I love what the Apostle Paul writes in this in Philippians 2 about being intentional. What he says about God, for God is working in you. You get this, right? God is, not he might, but he is working in you as a believer, giving you the desire and the power, desire, power, authority to do the things that he's called you to do, to do what pleases him. And check this out, what he says. To do these things in such a way that you are shining a light in this crooked and perverse world that is full of crooked and perverse people. And I don't say that as an insult because just before this he says, and you too lived like this. We were all part of this. But a light shined into our life and now we are to be that light and shine into the lives of others. We have to be intentional about this because God's working in you. And then lastly, the point is, is missional. It's intentional because God's working and we need to identify God's work. And then lastly, because there's a purpose to it all. And this is Jesus talking in John chapter 12. Here's what he says. I'm sending you on a mission. Disciples, believers, I'm sending you to open their eyes, their eyes, the world. You are the light of the world. Jesus said it about himself first. I am the light of the world. So think about the, the credit that he is giving to his people. Think about the compliment that he's giving to his believers. I am the light of the world and the, my light now shines in you and this light in you now makes you the light of the world. You share in something incredible in Christ. I'm sending you to open their eyes, to illuminate the darkness so they may turn. Say turn. Turn. 
We use the word repent in church. You know, it's a big churchy word, but, but it means to turn away from, to change the way we think, to turn away from darkness to the light and from the power of Satan to God. So darkness to light, power of Satan, kingdom of Satan to the kingdom of God. Isn't that what you want? Isn't that what you want for your spouse? Isn't that what you want for your children, for your grandchildren? Isn't that what you should want for your neighbor's children? Isn't that what you should want for every single person? Because that's the desire of your Father in heaven. He continues in this and says, when they move from the power of Satan to the power of God, I love this next part, then he says, they will receive forgiveness for their sins and be given a place among God's people who are set apart by faith in me. That's Jesus. That's why you have to be salty. That's why you have to shine your light. That's why it's important because there are lives at stake. And Jesus himself says, this is who you are and this is what you are supposed to be doing. It's pretty simple, right? It's pretty easy to understand. So let's say this one more time together because I believe repeating this, owning this identity is important for all of us. Let's say it together. I am the salt of the earth and a light in the darkness that brings glory to God. You should just repeat that over and over and over and over because that's who you are. That's your identity. And once you know who you are, then you'll know what to do. You are salt and you are light. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, we love you and we thank you for this morning. And we thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to dig into your word and to learn more about you. And today, God, I thank you for these passages, this teaching of Jesus that you have preserved on our behalf. And Lord, what we pray now at this time as we enter into a time of communion is that we reflect on this message. We reflect on the words of Jesus, the truth that that we are salt and we are light and we've been given a purpose and this is all relational. This is about everyone on this planet. It's about our connection to them relationally and our connection with you. And Father, once we know who you are and who we are, that determines our identity and the truths and the promises and the principles of scripture are now true about us. And we're to take that into this world to make a difference in the lives of the people around us, in our spheres of influence, even in this whole earth, on this whole world. We're supposed to reflect you. We're supposed to bring you glory in everything that we do. And Father, the truth is we don't always get this right. The truth is we forget. We get distracted. We get contaminated. The truth is we try to hide and we try to conceal because that's what the nature of sin does. But Father, we know that in hiding and in concealing, in the deception that there's no life there. In the darkness, there's no life. Instead, what we find is a kingdom, a master chains that that bind us and keep us down, that hold us back, that keep us from living out the life that you would have us live. And Father, I pray that if there's anyone here this morning that continues to walk in the darkness, that Father, today you would bring light into their lives. And maybe Father, right where they sit, even at this moment, if they don't know what to do, maybe they would just begin to speak to you. That's, that's what prayer is all about. That we would just begin to speak to you just like this. To say, Heavenly Father, I'm so sorry. I'm sorry that I've lived a life in the darkness. That I've allowed this world to contaminate and dilute who I am. That I've listened to the world's lies about my identity instead of you. And today, Father, I accept your identity through your son, Jesus. I accept his sacrifice on the cross as payment for my sin. And I choose to walk 
in the light to follow your son Jesus each and every day empowered by the gift of your spirit thank you for your forgiveness and for your love and if that's you today and that's something you can attest to that's that's someone's prayer in this, this room today, this morning, Father, then, then we celebrate with them. We want to know about it. We want to join them in their journey. We want to help them learn more about what it means to be your child, to be salt, to be light, and to be used in your kingdom. Because as your son says, you send us into the world to shine a light so bright that it reveals the corruption of this warped world that we live in. And it brings people from the power of Satan to the power of God, and our sins are forgiven forever. And we know that's the desire of your heart, Father, and I pray that that's the desire of all of us today. And if we're here and we've been a Christian for years and years and years, but Father, we know we feel the tension, we feel the pain and the pressure. We've allowed the world to dilute and contaminate and to hide our light. No more, Father. I pray that you remove those obstacles in our lives. You redeem those obstacles in our lives and you change everything. Help us to regain because only you can do it. Help us to regain our flavor, our saltiness to have purpose to be used for your kingdom and we pray all this Father because of the sacrifice that you made on our behalf through your son Jesus who on the night that he spent his last supper his last Passover meal with his disciples he offered up the emblem of bread and the wine that would represent his body that he would very shortly after, give up for our sake. And it's because of his sacrifice, Lord, that we are able to come to you, that we are able to receive the gifts of forgiveness and mercy and love from you, to put them in practice in our lives and to begin living them out through the power of your spirit that you provide. And we give you thanks right now as we share in this moment together of communion. We love you and we thank you and we praise you. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Once again, I just want to say thank you for being here this morning. And uh, for you, if you decided to take a next step today and maybe you wanted to pray that prayer or maybe you would like to pray with somebody after service, we would invite you to stick around, stay with us for that. And to keep the conversation going, here are three questions you can snap on your phone. They'll be on social media later to help keep the conversation going about today's message. We love you. We thank you. We're so glad that you spent part of your morning with us. And uh, we can't wait to see you again next week for part four of this series. God bless you. Have a great and wonderful rest of your day.